This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. I have with, with me this morning John Rubino, well-known author and publisher of the website DollarCollapse.com. Welcome back, John. It's been a while. Hey, Gord. Yeah, it's been two months. Sorry about last month. <laughs> well, Things you know, get out of hand sometimes. Well, yeah. you're you're a busy man, and uh, and and with all the things that are going on and what yeah. you're writing, continues to get busier and, and busier. But uh, John, let's just jump right into it. We're going to talk about Greece here this morning. You've put out some great articles. I have them up here on the on the screen recently. But rather than just uh, talking about the articles, which I hope to touch on, but can you kind of give some history here of what ha where, why we're in this situation with Greece for some of our listeners that may not be following us, so then we can get into trying to make sense of this puzzle that's going on there? Sure. Well, I, I think most people um, who, who don't obsess about this stuff on a daily basis, like you and I do, really don't know how Greece got here. And it's a fascinating story. And it, it begins with the, the introduction of the euro in 2002. When, when Europe went to a common currency, uh, they basically wanted to invite in anybody who was interested in joining the club. And so um, the, Greece was one of the early adopters, the people that were invited in to uh, drop the drachma and, and adopt the euro. Uh, the problem was that Greece's national numbers, you know, their, their government debt levels and growth levels and inflation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, didn't meet the criteria for the, the Maastricht Treaty um, numbers that were required to become a member of the Eurozone and to, uh, to exist within the common currency. So um, rather than waiting and get, getting their house in order, they basically just lied about what their numbers were. So they, they, with the help of Goldman Sachs, doctored their books and got accepted into the Eurozone and then once they were in, it turned out that their numbers were nothing like they, they said they were. In other words, they, they were running much higher deficits than, uh, than they were allowed to run under the Eurozone Treaty. And, uh, and their inflation rate was high. And, and basically, by every major economic statistic, they didn't really belong. And that was overlooked by the marketplace in the middle of the last decade when everybody got the idea for some reason that uh, if a country was in the eurozone their debt was fungible it was basically identical to any other country's debt within the eurozone so the peripheral countries italy and portugal and ireland and and greece were able to borrow for a while at the same rate as germany and uh, so basically that was handing uh, you know an unlimited credit card to a teenager with a lot of these countries they just uh, maxed out those credit cards they borrowed huge amounts of money and greece was one of the countries that did that and so their debt, which was already too high, went through the roof. And then in the 2008-2009 crisis, when everybody sat down and, and decided to differentiate a bit between Italy and Germany, for instance, uh, the, uh, the interest rate on peripheral European debt went up, which meant the interest costs on this debt went up. And, uh, and that allowed everyone to see that some countries can manage and some countries can't. And Greece was the, the main country that couldn't manage. So they had their first crisis back in 2010, 2011. Um, and at the time, it was a serious crisis because the big European banks owned most of Greece's outstanding debt, which means that um, if Greece was going to default you know, and, and leave the Eurozone, which was actively discussed at the time, uh, that means we're going to have to take massive losses on that Greek debt, and a lot of them would be made insolvent by that. You know, the European banking system would have had a kind of a cascade failure if Greece left the Eurozone. So they papered it over. The European authorities gave Greece some money, gave them some extra debt, and, uh, 
and allowed them to function for a little while longer while they moved all that Greek debt from the big European banks to the European central banks, in other words, onto taxpayers. And so now the Greek crisis uh, came to a head again in 2015, but on very different terms. Now the European Central Bank and the IMF own all this Greek debt and the big banks are off the hook, big commercial banks. So that the risk of Greece leaving the Eurozone was a lot less than it was back when. So the Greeks, with their new government that was elected on an anti-austerity program, thought that they could, um, they could play a game of chicken with Europe in which if they just refuse to um, cut their pensions and dramatically cut government spending in general, uh, which would impoverish their people even further, uh, that Europe would blink and uh, give them some debt relief. In other words, cut the value of their debt, just write off half of it or whatever, and which would put Greece in theory back on a, uh, a platform that was sustainable where they could go forward and manage their, their own finances. Uh, but Europe wasn't buying it because if they cut that kind of a deal for Greece, um, then Italy and Spain and Portugal would line up with for, for the same deal and they're much bigger economies. So it would cost vastly more to print enough euros to bail Italy out, for instance. Uh, probably too much more, probably uh, enough that it would cause the euro to plunge in value and you'd have a currency crisis to replace your, your debt crisis. So they basically told Greece, no, go ahead and leave if you want to. So Greece got to the point where it looked like it was leaving and it had a, a banking crisis. Nobody wanted to hold Greek bank accounts anymore because they assumed that those accounts, which were, were frozen for a week, they're still frozen by the way, the, the Greek banks haven't yet reopened. Um, they, were, they were frozen and everyone was afraid they were gonna be converted into drachmas at say a 50% haircut. So Greece had a little mini crack up boom you know, in, in Austrian economics, there is a concept called a crack-up boom in which uh, when people lose faith in their currency, they don't want to hold it anymore. So the minute they get paid, they convert it into other stuff by going out and buying real things. Uh, and so in Greece, you saw, you know, electronic stores uh, with empty shelves where everybody was coming in buying stereos and TV sets uh, with their Greek bank accounts. And that was because nobody trusted Greek bank accounts anymore. You know, they, they still trusted the euro, but they didn't trust euros on deposit in Greek banks. And so that, that's a little hint of what's coming for the rest of the world pretty soon when we lose faith in the actual fiat it, currencies. It, it is, isn't it? Yes. It's, yeah, it is. It is indeed. Yeah. For those of us who've been watching Greece, there's a whole series of telltales of the events and sequences you can probably expect that's coming to America at some point at some time. Sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt yeah. you, John. Yeah, Greece, no, that's okay. Greece is the canary in the coal mine. That's, yeah. that's really the takeaway from this story is that uh, as goes Greece, so goes the rest of the world eventually. Uh, but um, when, when the Greeks saw what a disorderly exit from the Eurozone was going to look like, it would basically be a dictatorship for a while where they closed all the banks and they imposed capital controls and didn't let their people move their money anywhere and, and, and then impoverished savers by converting their euros to drachmas at a 50% discount. Um, they, they backed off and they decided to go with the devil they know, which is austerity, and accept Europe's terms uh, rather than the, the devil that they didn't know but uh, were, were terrified of, which is a disorderly exit from the Eurozone. Um, and so that's where Greece is now. It has accepted these really onerous terms from Greece and, or from Germany and the IMF and the European Central Bank in which they got to cut pensions and, uh, and generally government spending, which will make their people even poorer. So they have to do something called an internal devaluation. John, John, if I could interrupt you there in that, yeah. that sequence before we go on. You know, they went through that little iteration twice. The Sunday night when uh, Cyprus said, I'm going to call a referendum. And the people were, they didn't want to leave the euro. They were, they were, he, the, it was going to be a vote against him on that Sunday night when he announced the referendum. And then all of a sudden, it got so heavy handed that on uh, Tuesday night in their parliament, they realized they were going to lose the referendum really badly. And, and they, <laughs> when they were in banks, they were going to seize up on some of the pension payments. They were already down to 60 euros a day, able to get out of the out of the banks minimally. So he capitulated. He said to Greece, because there was the time clock was Tuesday night, midnight. And so on Wednesday, he said, I'll go along with the terms and conditions. And of course, Germany and everybody said, no, they're off the table, it ended. 
So there's what he and by the way, you're going for a referendum. So he so he said, well, we'll go with the referendum and the public between that Wednesday and the Sunday when the referendum completely switched and he got an overwhelming 60 percent. No, because the people basically said, if we don't go, we're really going to be screwed. But I want I think it was more I am tired of being dictated to it was almost a vote for democracy, having some control, even though they know it was going to hurt them more. Now, as you say, he got that. Now he goes back and he says, I surrender and takes work current terms and conditions. It's even worse. Now the people are saying, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, because they, they could have gotten better terms right, first, three or four months ago. Oh, before. And, and it's yeah. just, every time it just gets worse and worse. It's, yeah, to it me, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is it's like Germany is trying to force them out of out of the euro, out of the zone, with no, mm -hmm. because as you said, the issue is they they had to go increase the VAT tax, pensions had to be cut, and that's suicide. But they wanted, they Greece wanted debt relief, no debt relief. Now IMF is yelling, no, you got to have give them debt relief, it, or it will not work. Anyway, I interrupt your story because let's yeah, get to that well, debt it's, relief. It's it's interesting to see the IMF being the voice of reason in a, yeah. a financial <laughs> discussion because that, that doesn't you. happen very often, but. Um, yeah, the the current deal obviously isn't going to work because it doesn't cut Greece's debt, but it does cut government spending. So you get this downward spiral. You know, Greece's economy has already contracted by 25 percent in, in the last three years. They have a Great Depression, to put yeah, it for America. Yeah, well, it, it is as that, bad as the U.S. Exactly. That's what's going on. Yeah. And now they're going to get more austerity. Yeah, so if you yeah they're Greeks, going to raise taxes and cut pensions. This is where civil, civil war breaks out when you have these sort of things. This is the yeah. modern day Versailles Treaty. And yeah. you know what? Yeah. Well, how Germany reacted to the Versailles Treaty in the 20s, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think Europe's um, take on this is that uh, at this point, you know, Greece can't really hurt them because it's a tiny little country to begin with. It's just a rounding error in terms of European Central Bank monetary policy. And all the bonds are owned by these big institutions that can just write them off and print new currency to cover the write-offs. You know, it's, it's not a big deal anymore. And the real danger to the Eurozone is debt relief for Greece um, in a form that causes Italy to want the same deal, because that's unmanageable you know that's just too many euros that you got to create to cut Italy's debt in half and, uh, and and so that for Europe would then be the devil they don't know you know Greece leaving is something they they kind of get now they, they think they know what it would be like it would be messy but it would be manageable and so they're willing to accept that and so now for Greece they're, they're in a position where they've, they've accepted this deal that clearly won't work and if the guys in charge, if uh, Syriza, run by Cyprus now, um, tries to go through the motions of imposing this deal on Greek citizens, then in the next election, they'll probably lose and be replaced by somebody else who runs against the deal. But the only parties that are left, you know, you can't go with the, the old conservatives because they're, they're the ones who engineered the crisis to begin with. And you can't go with the socialists because they're the guys in power right now. And so that just leaves the crazies. OK, you got the fringe parties, the, the communists and the fascists out there. And, and so it's not clear how the next election plays out, except that the guys in charge are going to be so unpopular that they probably won't win. And, and so the, the game begins again. You know, you, you elect people who um, ran against this deal and want to repudiate it. And... Um, and, and then so you get another Greek crisis somewhere in the future. So th this crisis has legs. You know, it's not over yet, okay. and it's going to go on for a while. And, and, you know, there's no really clear resolution to any of it because waiting in the wings are the other peripheral Eurozone countries who can't function under a, a strong Euro regime either. And, you know, if you look at a chart of Italy's debt, uh, they don't have it under control. It's it's growing at an accelerating rate, which means their problems are are getting bigger and bigger. You know, they're still digging themselves a deeper and deeper hole. And same thing with Portugal, and to an extent, the same thing with Spain. You know, they've got very serious problems, although soaring debt isn't as serious for them, but they still aren't really viable in the Eurozone. So this thing has a long way to run because... However Greece is resolved, assuming it is resolved someday, uh, the focus just shifts to who's next. 
you know, and uh, and who's next is bigger and scarier than Greece. Um, and, and so the only eventual resolution of this that maintains the Eurozone is a, is a kind of United States of Europe in which Germany basically just takes over, you know, that uh, um, there, there's one central government in Europe and there's one monetary policy and one military budget and one tax system um, largely determined <clears throat> by whoever's running Germany at the time. And that's not really attractive for most of the rest of Europe, I, I think. think. So. <laughs> and you know what? It's also not attractive for most Germans because that means they're responsible then for Italy's debt. You know, Italian debt literally becomes German debt. And so, I don't know. There, there's no real solution for this because it was created with a fatal flaw at the beginning. And it m may be possible, it may be true that it never could have been created with anything other than a fatal flaw. I don't know. But it was created with that fatal flaw, which is that uh, th these constituent governments within the Eurozone have their own budgets. And, uh, and so they're going to follow their own national impulses to the extent that they can. And those are contradictory impulses. You know, what Germany wants and what Spain and Greece want, uh, based on their, their respective cultures, are, are different things. So we'll see. But uh, the, the story will go on and on. You and I have tons to talk about in, in the next couple of years. It's still, it's still early. So even if the Greek people, the government, goes along with this terrible deal, and assuming that each of the countries in the EU were to ra ratify it from Finland, a lot of them really are even opposed to the postal, but let's assume it is. We've mm -hmm. got IMF, who are a big lender in here, saying, we're not going along with this. <laughs> <laughs> We're not. And you say, why? Yeah. Well, because they think this whole thing will not work because there's not enough debt relief. There's not enough haircuts on the debt. And therefore, the whole thing is a problem. And they're just in for a nickel, in for a bigger dime. Yeah. What? Well, it's the opposite of debt relief. They're, they're lending more money to Greece. Precisely. So Greece's um, um, debt to GDP, government debt to GDP, which is now currently 170 or something like that, 170 percent, is going to go up above 200 percent. Um, when this deal is implemented. So, you know, how, how do you function if you're a, uh, a, a not super productive country and your debt is twice your GDP? You, you, the answer is you can't unless you're in a negative interest rate environment. See, then we get into the war on cash and negative interest rates and stuff like that, which is one solution to excessive debt. You make interest rates negative and then your debt shrinks naturally because uh, people are paying you to own your debt. So uh, uh, that branch of the uh, the capital structure of the global financial system shrinks over time. But that opens up a Pandora's box of all kinds of crazy things. You know, when you have widespread negative interest rates, um, what does that do to the, the signaling mechanism of the rate structure? You know, who, who knows? You know, this is completely uncharted territory. And the landmines that you create when, uh, and, you know, this plays into your, your series on financial repression. I mean, negative interest rates are pretty much the poster child for, for that concept. And that's one solution that they're all looking at out there. You know, the war on cash is still ongoing. Negative interest rates, every time there's any kind of a hint of a crisis out there, um, Swiss interest rates drop to, uh, to more severely negative levels and German rates go further out on the yield curve negative. And, and uh, that's because the, everybody is afraid of what's going to happen in the global financial system. So they pile into the safest instruments. And the governments of the world kind of encourage this because these low interest rates make it easier for them to continue on their, their dysfunctional path. You know, if you're borrowing too much money and interest rates are high, that's a crisis waiting to happen. But if you're borrowing too much money and interest rates are negative, you're kind of being paid to borrow, you know, and uh, it's like a teaser rate on a credit card or something like that, where uh, you don't have to pay anything for two years. So you think, wow, free money. Governments are human. You know, they, they think um, free money when they see negative interest rates, just like you and I do with a teaser rate credit card. And so it leads them to crazier and crazier policies, or I should say it leads them to continue with today's crazy policies longer than they would otherwise be able to. In case a lot of People believe that this is, has nothing to do with the United States or is not coming to America like we talked about. We have to think of Greece and the peripherals in Europe. That is, as you mentioned, Italy, Portugal, Spain, who've got serious, serious similar, similar issues. The peripherals in the United, 
and, and these peripherals can't print their own money because it's handled by the EU. They can't debase their currency and get out of this problem. So they're into the, they're locked into this issue that that sovereign countries that have control can can get around in a stealth manner, sort of for some period of time. In the United States, what we have those peripherals are really your local state government and cities who can't print money, have to live within their bond structure, and insufficient revenues that don't come down from the federal level, uh, federal level. We're seeing those issues, we saw them in Detroit. Look at Puerto Rico that's going on there right now. It's exactly a mirror image, same issues, taxation, pensions, overspent, all sorts of funny games with tax deductibilities on the bonds, which has had a flight of money. We're seeing it in Illinois, city of Chicago, et cetera. So it's, it, it's coming at in America in a different way. I, my my opinion, same and, problem. And the mono lines that preceded the 2008, the bond insurers for munis, have you noticed the charts? They're in free fall. Same <laughs> thing as 2008. Not saying we're seeing 2008, but we got the symptoms. It says it's coming, it's washing ashore here. I had a formative experience shorting those guys back in 2007, 2008, you know, so they, they, they have a, a place in my heart. <laughs> it's not, and they, yeah, and we're, we're seeing a lot of the same stuff. Um, happen again. And, and the important thing to understand about state and local finances in the U.S. is that seven years into a, re um, a recovery, they're not improving. You know, a lot of the badly run states and pension funds are actually um, going deeper and deeper into debt and digging themselves deeper and deeper into holes. Cappers, for instance, the, uh, the big California pension fund, just reported that their last fiscal year's um, investment portfolio return was 2% or 2.7% or something like that. And they need 7.5% to meet their obligations. So when when pension funds, and this is in relatively good financial markets. It's you know, a financial let, let it, market as you can have as an investor, yeah. theoretically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so let, um, let us have a correction in the stock or bond markets. And you'll see these pension funds that are already underfunded go really, really deeply into a hole from which they really can't dig out. Because if you lose 30%, you've got to outperform forever after that to get back to an average of 7 or 8%. 40% 40, 40 of these pensions are in bonds, and we have a bigger bond bubble than we actually yeah. have an equity bubble for those who are following it. Mm -hmm. and, and we still can't, and we still have a basically close to a $10 trillion unfunded pension problem, public and private, all levels across the United States. The, 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 this is the, tipping to, the ticking time bomb because they're using their bonds, which are supposed to be for infrastructure. They're trying to sneak them through to pay operating expense, which is interest payments and pensions as we have 75 million baby boomers retiring on these phenomenal public service pensions. Pension what? bonds. Yeah, that's <laughs> another thing. Uh, that, you know, back um, in, in the previous cycle during the housing bubble, General Motors borrowed a lot of money and used it to shore up its pension fund by um, investing that money in equity. So basically they were, um, they were borrowing, they were buying stocks on margin in effect. And that turned out to be crazy because then they went bankrupt, you know, but um, a lot of state and local pension funds are doing the same thing. They have these things called pension bonds, where, as, as you said, they borrow money in order to shore up their pension funds. So they, they then use that money to buy stocks and bonds and hope to generate a return that's higher than the cost of the borrowing, which is investing on margin. You know, that, that's what aggressive individual investors do at the peak of a cycle, and then they get hugely burned time after time after time. You know, you look at uh, margin debt soaring in the stock market and then crashing in the next cycle. Well, the pension funds of, of U.S. states and cities are doing the same thing. So, yeah, yeah, we're, we're building in a structural crisis in the U.S. that's kind of invisible because nobody understands. You know, this is really inside baseball. Nobody understands underfunding and pension bonds and stuff like that. And, and uh, so they can get away with it because it's so obscure. But the numbers that this, these policies will generate at some point will be unambiguous. You know, you won't be able to hide a trillion dollars shortfall in your pension fund. And that's what people are going to be looking at pretty soon. You know, and when you when these numbers start becoming front page news uh, and the pension funds have to act on them in some way, in other words, cut benefits really dramatically or or uh, raise contribution levels on current workers, you know, stuff like that.
because that's that's a pocketbook issue for one group or the other. And they're going to start paying attention. And then it becomes interesting for newspapers to write stories about it. And, and then it'll come out, you know, and th that's part of the landscape of the next downturn. And so we should be prepared for this, just as, you know, the, the mortgage bubble rising defaults was going to be part of the, the landscape back then. Pension defaults are going to be part of the landscape going forward. And it's going to be one of the things that, uh, that seem to come out of nowhere because nobody's paying attention, but will be huge when it happens. The, the, uh, we're going to an era, John, I personally believe of what I'll refer to as pension poverty. And that is a lot of these pensions are going to be, unfortunately, in default. There is not enough government assurance at, in any stretch of the imagination to, uh, to cover it. And if you start to pay attention to the taxation, for example, people don't have pensions anymore, basically. They're all contributory with $18,500 in 401k. That's, you're not going to retire very long on that. That's on the average. So what's happened is they have to depend on, on their Social Security checks. And let's assume that you have a $20,000 a year Social Security <laughs> check coming in. I don't think people realize that once you make over $35,000 on your gross adjusted income, you start to pay 55% tax on that Social Security. And at 44, you pay 85%. So basically, you start handing it back. And the, where I'm getting into the pension poverty, 30000 is poverty line. So if you're living on just Social Security, you can't, you've can't. you got to get out and work, at least supplement it somehow, or maybe you're drawing out your IRAs. You're suddenly, anything over those numbers, you're paying, you're, you're paying it back, the Social Security, on a, on, a, on a tax basis. You're locked in. You're on, yeah. You're, you're, and, it's, it's in, and it's in there in design, not, I don't think intentionally, I think it was done as a sort of means testing for the wealthy, but by default and with inflation and, and the cost of living, it's, it's going to hurt millions and millions of people unless they're on a government pension. Then they just have well, to worry see, about default. Here's the difference. Um, with a, a, like CalPERS or something, a, a, a public-private pension fund that has to meet certain obligations going forward and has to get that actual money from somewhere, they will have to default in the sense that they'll have to cut benefits explicitly. With Social Security, the government's going to do something else that, that's trickier. They're going to generate higher rates of inflation somehow to manage their debt going forward. And then they're going to lie about the inflation calculation that they use to adjust upward Social Security payments. So let's say they have 4% real inflation. They will adjust your Social Security by 2.4% or something like that. So that in real terms, they cut your Social Security payment year after year, but they won't tell you that. They'll say, oh, we raised it by 2.5%. Well, your, your cost of living went up by 4%. So your real Social Security benefit is going down year after year, but it'll be a, a, a hidden default over time. And, and you know, you can make the case they've been doing that for a long time, but they're going to do it in a more aggressive way as things get crazier and crazier. So yeah, in the same way that Greek pensioners are being impoverished by what's going on there, uh, American pensioners will also be impoverished, but it'll be more secretive if Social Security is the pension plan in question. You know, it'll be explicit if it's your uh, your, your company's pension plan or your organization's pension plan, but it'll be implicit and secretive if it's the government doing it because we have a printing press. You know, the U.S. government can inflate away its currency and get away with that. Can't, and so they they're having their problems today because of that because they can't inflate away their own currency, which which kind of takes us to the final solution to the Greek issue, which is to inflate away the euro itself. See, you know, Greece and Italy can't create more euros, but the European Central Bank can. And it could be seen eventually as the one way out of this dilemma to just depreciate the euro um, really aggressively over time. And so if you, if you value the euro by 40 percent, let's say, and it was already cut by 25 or 30 percent in the last year, which has helped them immensely. But if you cut it even more aggressively then that makes everybody's debts within the Eurozone easier to manage. And maybe it gets Italy and Greece out from under their problems. But I think not because then it, it absolves them of the need to actually change the structure of their economy. But um, it at least buys some time. And so Germany is standing in the way of this because they, they have 
living memory of hyperinflation and they don't ever want to see that again you know but the guys who remember it are dying off and uh, the the baby boomers are now in charge soon to be replaced by millennials and and they don't remember any of this stuff all they know is that times are hard today and uh, and some breathing room could be bought with a, a weaker currency and so the that might be Europe's strategy at some point but then, of course, that's just the currency war scenario where that hurts us. So we got to respond in kind and, and you get the race to the bottom. So in other words, <laughs> there's no solution, Gordon. No, no matter what we look at, uh, there, there are secondary and tertiary effects that are increasingly horrendous and, uh, and turn out to be worse than the cure. And so, you know, there's no way out of this. We borrow too much money and we have to do something that is, is really wrenching and really painful to get out of it. And that's what financial history says, you know, it's been tried over and over again, borrowing too much money to live in the present without worrying about the future, uh, leaves the people in the future with very hard choices to make. And that's where we are now, you know, we're, we're living in the long term future of some guys who made some decisions back in the 70s, 80s and 90s, um, that are now coming back to bite us. John, we're up against our hard line. Any uh, last comments you'd like to make, and how could our listeners find out, uh, follow more of your writings? Well, there are always last comments because there, there's never enough time to cover everything that's going on out there, Gord. So we'll, we'll save what comes next for, for our next discussion. Um, and to uh, to see more about what I'm doing on a daily basis, uh, go, go to dollarclaps.com. Uh, that's a, a site that covers a lot of this stuff on an ongoing basis. And it's also got a link where you can buy uh, my most recent book called The Money Bubble, co-written with Gold Money's James Turk. Who I just had on recently with an interview. Good interview. And yeah. uh, very much uh, enjoyed it. John, I'll catch you again next month. Great. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks for having time. Editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com. <laughs>